Hey, welcome back to the channel. Today we are going to be talking about two-factor authentication. We're going to go over some different considerations, including the difference between using SMS for two-factor authentication or using email or using an app or using a hardware security key like the YubiKey. The basic premise of two-factor authentication is that it's something that you know, so that would be your password, and then two-factor authentication is something that you have. So in this case, it would be like a code that you put into the website. The other thing I'm going to point out is this video covers the essentials. I know some of my videos kind of get into the weeds with all the technical details. For something like this, I could have potentially made a video that would be like two hours long covering all the, the details of all this stuff, how it works behind the scenes. I wasn't going to get into all of that. This is just the essentials to get people up and running. So that way you have some different options. You know all about the some of the different apps that are out there, the different options turn on uh, like SMS or an app, and then some of the different considerations like pros and cons of each of those. So we'll go ahead and get started. So first thing I'm gonna cover is the desktop version of Authy is being discontinued. I'm going to cover this real quick because there's a lot of people that use this. Even if you are not an Authy user, I'm gonna cover this here real quick. This applies to everyone that uses 2FA. This is something you really need to pay attention to. So Authy is being, well, I'll just cover this real quick and then anyone that's not using Authy can just skip ahead with timestamps, but this is something you really need to watch here so this way you don't end up getting having something bad happen and then you end up having to spend a bunch of time recovering accounts or potentially not ever getting your accounts back. So the thing with two-factor authentication, so this applies to Authy, but like I said, this applies to all the different apps or all the different methods. It's really important to make sure you're disabling this stuff before you, so let's say you want to switch apps. So let's say you're using Authy right now, but then you want to move to, let's say Google Authenticator, or Ente, or you're using SMS right now, but you want to switch to email, for example. Before you turn, like before you start disabling stuff, turning stuff off, you always need to make sure you are turning off your existing two-factor authentication method. So for example, let's say you have accounts that are secured with a cell phone, you get SMS messages. But let's say one day you decide, well, I want to get a new phone and I want to get a new phone number and you go to, to the local cell phone store and you disable your, your phone number without turning off SMS authentication for your accounts, you could potentially get locked out of your accounts if you don't have another way to get in there or they don't have a way to get you access back in your account, then you're gonna end up getting locked out or it's gonna take a lot of time to recover stuff and get back in there, go through like a verification process that you are who you say you are. So it's just really important to make sure that anytime you're switching between methods or anything like that, if you're gonna shut down email accounts, shut down phone numbers, switch to something else, or change between 2FA apps, or switch from an app to a hardware key, shut off the old method first. Now, for those of you that do not use Authy, you can go ahead and skip ahead with timestamps. I'm gonna cover some stuff that is specific to Authy. Uh, because I know it's really popular with a lot of people and I want to make sure that I cover this with people that are currently using it. So the desktop version of Authy is being discontinued. The end of life is on March 19th. I should have made a video covering this sooner, but I hadn't really given it much thought until just a couple of days ago. And I was like, okay, this is something that I should probably make a video about. So one of the things that sucks, if you're using Authy and you want to switch, you're like, you know what? It really sucks. The desktop app's going away. The thing that sucks with Authy is there's no export available, so you are, are going to have to, if you want to switch to a different app, you're going to have to take the time to go in, turn all your, your codes off first through the account, and then figure out what app you want to use, and then go and, and turn on, uh, bring in all of the codes for the new app. So that's just something to be aware of. Now, like I said, so end of life is on March 19th, so that's just in a few days here. Authy did not specify if the app is going to keep working or if it's not. So I don't know for sure, like no one knows at this point, if on the 19th, if you're using the desktop app and you go to log into it, if it will just no longer work and you can no longer pull your codes and it just says this app no longer works, or if it will continue working. So I think the safe assumption to make here would be that you need to get all of your codes. If this is something that's a big deal for you, get all of your codes, all of your accounts off of here and changed over to something else before March 19th. So basically you have like three days from the time you're watching this video or maybe even only two days to uh, make sure that happens. The other thing, so even if it does continue to work, I would not advise continuing to use it. So let's say they are not shutting the app down, the old version will still work. The problem is that there's going to be bugs that come up, there's going to be security vulnerabilities. 
None of that stuff is going to be getting patched or fixed, which presents an attacker an opportunity to be able to go in and get access to that stuff. So you don't want to keep using it if it does continue to work. Now, it is still going to be available on mobile. So if you have, whether it's Android or iPhone, it still is going to be available. The other thing, so let's say you're only using the desktop app right now. There is a security setting within Authy that will disable the ability to install the app on different devices. And let's say you have that enabled, this gets shut off on the 19th and you haven't done anything about this. Well, you'd be locked out. You wouldn't be able to get access to any of your codes because you'd go to try to add it on, let's say a phone or a tablet. And it's going to say, this account had the security setting turned on to prevent installs on any additional devices. And if the desktop app gets shut down, well, you're gonna be in for a bad time. So just, just something to be aware of. It's a little bit of a pain in the ass for the people who used it. They're shutting this down sooner than they had originally told people it was supposed to take place sometime in August or something like that. And then just not too long ago, they said, oh, we changed our minds. We're shutting it down in March. Okay, so let's go ahead and cover some considerations for the app side of things. So apps, one thing you'll see is the abbreviation TOTP. This just means time-based, one-time passwords. That's what it means like when someone's talking about the different two-factor authentication apps. Now, there is a lot of different choices. Some are, some are definitely better than others. This is a thing where doing due diligence and doing some research is really important. So some of the some of the really popular ones, this is not an all-inclusive list, is things like Google Authenticator, Microsoft Authenticator, Aegis, Ante, 2FAS. There's others out there. I wasn't going to name every possible one, but we're going to cover some stuff in the app stores here pretty soon. Now, the thing is with password managers, you can also use two-factor authentication. So you can do this through like Bitwarden or KeyPass or something like that. So let's say, let's take Bitwarden for example. Let's say you want to have your password manager also generate your two-factor authentication codes. Typically with that, you'd want to make sure that you have some sort of a two-factor authentication for your password manager in case something were to happen. You wouldn't want it to get compromised. It just adds another layer of security. So let's say in the case of Bitwarden, for example, you want to use two-factor authentication. One thing you could look at doing there so I'll talk about this here in just a little bit, is hardware key. So you could get something like a YubiKey that is a two-factor authentication. It's a hardware key, so you plug it in your computer, you press a button. So you put in your password, you have the hardware key, then you get access to Bitwarden, and then Bitwarden manages not only all of your passwords, but you could also set it to manage and generate your two-factor authentication codes. So password managers are a, an option. Some people don't like that. They say there's security issues with it. I think really as long as you're configuring stuff, you're setting up security of stuff properly with good passwords, all that kind of stuff, it's probably not something to sweat too much about, but just something, again, due diligence. Next thing that's really important, again, I'll cover this on a specific app here pretty soon just so you can see what I mean when I'm talking about this but it's really important to keep backups secure. Now, some are not going to be an option, some are locally. So 2FAS, for example, or Ente is another one. So you can set these up to where there's backups done, but you can also have them set up to where backups are not done. They are just on the device. The thing with that is you, if you lose access to that, Again, if you ever have to do recovery on any accounts because you lost your way to get two-factor authentication codes, it's going to be a massive pain in the ass. It's going to just be a, a major annoyance. And again, you could potentially get locked out of accounts. So the thing is, if you have a way to restore your seeds, meaning let's say you have an iPhone, you have two FAS, you lose your iPhone, and then you go get another iPhone and you're setting things up. Now, if you have turned on the iCloud backup feature, again, I'll show this here in just a moment. If you have that feature turned on, then what you can do is go set up a different iPhone, import those seeds. The other thing is make sure you research your app to make sure it's going to suit your specific needs. Again, some of these apps are certainly better than some of the other options. So let's say, for example, you have narrowed it down between this just one example that is can they can be used is Ente versus 2FAS. Now 2FAS does not have so you could turn on iCloud backups, but there's no option to make an account. But let's say you want to be able to log into your account, pull codes. 
and Tay has the option where it's again on the device only, or you can actually set up an account with Ante to where, let's say, then you could log into another phone or, or whatever and pull up your codes that way. So again, it's just make sure that whatever app you use is going to suit your specific needs. Next day, so let's cover some app stuff here real quick. So one of the things I'm going to caution people with, there's bad actors out there. There's also bad copies, people that want to make something, but they don't do a good job of it. Now, the thing is, when it comes to security software, so it doesn't matter whether it's antivirus or a two-factor authentication app or whatever, a, a password manager is another example. It's really important that there is a dedicated team behind the project that is actively being developed because there will always be bugs. There will always be security vulnerabilities that are found. It's really important to make sure that updates are happening all of the time, that there's a good team behind the project. And so when I say bad copies is some people will try to make an app and there's a lot of good apps out there that I guess you could say are not really well known. There's not a lot of people that use them, but they're good apps nonetheless. This is not, when it comes to something like a two-factor authentication app, I would not recommend using something that has like, let's say a thousand users and there's one or two people that are developing the project. I, there's, my personal opinion, I don't think that's a good idea. And then as far as bad actors, there's plenty of examples. If you go back and do some Google searching, there's a ton of different examples over the years of malicious apps that made it onto the app store where something got on there and it was basically a virus and it was siphoning a whole bunch of people's data off of their, their cell phone or their tablet or whatever the case. So it's just really important to be cautious about the one that you're going to select and make sure you're doing some research. So let me cover some of that stuff now. So I'll cover the, so let's say to the 2FAS app here real quick. So let's say this is one that you want to go with. So this is what I was talking about right here is the iCloud Sync. So let's say you have two or three different iPhones or you lose an iPhone, you have this installed, but you have the cloud sync turned on. Then what you can do is pull up a, like go and buy a different iPhone, set that up and then pull in all of your seeds. That's really important to be able to have that backup. Some people might not like that. There might be security or privacy considerations for people. If that's the case, that's completely fine. There's no issue with not having backup, just be aware of the risks associated with it. Now, one thing that I would recommend, and so like they have this written down here in the, the fine print, is it says, we strongly recommend to turn 2FAS backup synchronization on to keep your token secure in iCloud. One of the things that they mentioned in the app, I don't see it in this picture, but it was something like, let's say you go and start deleting stuff, but then sync is turned on on one of your accounts is we'll sync that to another account. So just be aware of that. So let's say you wanna delete a whole bunch of stuff or delete stuff off of one phone. But if you have iCloud sync turned on, is it will sync all those changes over to your, your other devices. So just keep that in mind when, you, when you're doing that with one of these apps here. Now, when I'm talking about bad copies and bad actors, now to the Apple App Store, generally speaking, has better standards than the Android App Store, but, so here's what I'm talking about. So if you scroll down to the bottom of this 2FAS app, it will say you might also like, and, and this will show up on whatever device. So if you have an Android or an Apple, it works the same on both where it will show similar apps. Now let's say you're like, okay, well, I don't wanna use 2FAS, but here's some similar apps. Let me see what else is similar. And by the way, this is not an all-inclusive all list. There's a lot of stuff that's missing out of here. Here's what I'm talking about. And by the way, I'm going to give a disclaimer. I'm not saying these are bad actors and I'm not saying these are bad copies. I'm not saying that at all. This is just things to consider here. So let's look at some of these different apps here. So you have the Authenticator app, you have Authenticator app, you have Authenticator Plus, Authenticator app dash 2FA, Authenticator app dash fast 2FA. This is what I'm talking about. This is not, here's an example of one right here. This actually is slightly concerning and I don't know why the hell this is on the Apple App Store. This says Authy, Authenticator app, but it's spelled with two H's instead of one. This to me is a huge red flag. Now this could be a completely legitimate app, but to me this is a map, an app that is masquerading. So someone, if they type in, mistype and put in too many things and they're not paying attention here, they could install this. I just I really, when it comes to security software, 
I, I strongly recommend that people are taking the time to research this stuff, make sure there's a good team, that there's a solid user base. Uh, when it comes to stuff like antivirus and two-factor authentication apps, password managers, I'm not going to use something that has like a thousand users. I want something that is time-tested and has like proper development that's going on behind the scene. And then I'll just show you one other here. So this is the Ante app. So this is what I was talking about where, so you can either set up accounts. So they, they added this option in later where you could just set up accounts without having to make an account or you can also set up an account so that way you're not relying on something like iCloud backup, for example. Okay, and then, so one other thing with the Authenticator apps is some sites are going to give you backup codes. Just make sure that those are secured. So for example, some sites you'll go to turn on like an Authenticator app or email authentication or something like that. And they'll give you a list of five or 10 one-time use backup codes that they'll say, okay, if you ever lose your Authenticator app or you can't access an account to be able to verify that you are who you say you are, here's some backup codes. Just make sure that those are stored somewhere secure. You don't wanna leave those laying around. You don't wanna just put those like on a note on your desk, for example, and say, oh, this is for my, these are my Gmail backup codes, for example. You don't wanna do that. Make sure they're secured and, and locked away where other people can't get access to them. Okay, now let's cover SMS. This is just text messages. There's some specific stuff to watch out for when you're using SMS. So first of all, this is easy to set up and use. It's really easy to just type in on a phone. Instead of having to search for an app, you just type in your phone number. This is a very widely supported way of doing things. And it's really easy. And then you go to log into a website and they say, oh, check your phone for your code. You just pull up your text messages and your code is right there. So very good on convenience. The issue is there's some security problems with it. There's also a lot of support with this. And one of the issues that I've seen is that a lot of services still do not have the option to use an authenticator app. Some of them are still requiring that if you wanna use 2FA that it either, either has to be a cell phone or an email address. There's not anything that's really bad about using either one. I'm gonna cover that here in just a second. But the authenticator app is going to be the best choice. If you want to take things from a trade-off of security, privacy, and convenience, then the apps are about the best choice that you can make. But if you want something that's like ultra, ultra convenient, then text message is going to be the way to go. Now there's a thing that I will warn people on. So I made a video here, I think it was just a few weeks ago, talking about SIM swap attacks. And if you haven't seen it yet, I would recommend going and watching that. If you're going to use text message authentication, because this does apply here, is that someone can do a SIM swap attack. So they could go to, let's say they go to, they figure out your phone number, they figure out some pieces of personal information. What these attackers can do, and this does happen to be people, by the way, this is not a theoretical thing. This happens quite frequently. And there was a case not too long ago of uh, T-Mobile where they ended up doing this and it caused a huge ruckus and it made nationwide news. But the thing, so pe what people can do with this if they figure out like your phone number and then get some pieces of personal information is they can do a couple of different things. So they could go to, or they could call up the cell phone provider and say, hey, I lost my device. Can you please transfer this over to this new device here, transfer over the phone number. So you can do SIM hijacking and their SIM duplication. So that's just something to be cautious about. Now, when I say configure your cell service, the cell phone providers, I don't know how this is in Europe, but all of these cell providers here in America, as far as I'm aware of, allow the option to turn on a PIN number to help protect your account. So that's one thing you could look at doing is turning on a PIN number if you're going to do this. The other thing is you could see, you could talk to like go to your local cell phone store and talk to someone there and see if they can put a note on your account that says, if this person ever decides they want to change devices, it like let's say they want to call up and change device, tell them that they need to come into a physical store location with photo ID to verify that they are who they say they are. I don't know if all of them are going to do that, but that is an option that you could look at, have, like have them put a note on your account. But it, at the minimum, what you could do is look at at least locking down your account with a PIN number, so that way someone can't just transfer that phone number over to 
a different device. Now the thing with the cell phone is if you ever lose your device then again it's it applies this way with all two-factor if you lose your access to be able to get codes you could lose access to your accounts or have to spend a lot of time recovering them. Now the, the, again the thing that's specific to cell phones here if you ever want to switch phone numbers let's say you get a new phone and you want to go switch phone number it's really important that you take some time to go back through all of your accounts see which ones have two-factor authentication for text message turned on, then go and either disable that or what you could do is get your new phone first, keep your old phone active, switch everything over to the new phone, and then turn off your old cell phone number. A couple different ways you can do it there, but that's just really important so you don't lose access to anything. Anyway, let's go ahead and move on and cover email now. So very similar to SMS, text messages. It's easy to use, wide support. Now, the vast majority of websites that have two FA will either have one or both of these. Again, I've, I'm still coming across places that don't have support for apps. I don't know why. I don't know if these places just aren't taking security seriously, if they're not listening to their security team, if the, the executives or the suits are just blowing them off. But the, the option should be there. But I imagine within the next few years, we'll probably see this as a pretty should be pretty standard across damn near everything. Now, when it comes to email, again, like text message, there are some security concerns with using this. So first of all is cookie hijacking. Again, so I talked about the, so, okay, so I had that wrong. So this was a video that I made two or three months ago. I talked about SIM swap text. This was the video that I made about two or three weeks ago talking about cookie hijacking. Many a person has lost access to things like a Gmail or a Yahoo account with cookie hijacking. So it's just one thing to keep in mind. Poor passwords is another example. So if you have a, a bad password and you don't have 2FA turned on, that's kind of a big issue if you're gonna use email to get 2FA codes. The other thing is leaving your device unlocked. I know a lot of people don't take security super serious, but the problem is, Let's say you, and I know there's some people that will use like public computers. Some people will go to a library, for example, and use computers there or go to a cafe and use computers. I don't know how popular the internet cafes still are, if they still have desktops. I imagine there's some of them out there that still do this. Or let's say you even just have a cell phone, you leave it laying somewhere and you're around and there's other people around, but you don't have your device secured properly. If you don't have your device secured properly, then what people could do if they have enough time and the inclination to go do this kind of stuff is they could go in and start changing out codes, changing access to stuff. And a lot of people are going to leave email or have email logged in on their cell phones. So again, that becomes an issue where if you have a port, or if you're not using a password on your cell phone, for example, or if you allow other people to know what your cell phone password is, bad idea i know there's some people that allow other people to know their passwords i think that's really poor security but it's just me and then that also applies to stolen devices so about two months ago i watched a video of a youtuber who got stranded overseas because his stuff a bunch of his stuff got stolen someone got in his room and, and managed to take i believe the guy ended up getting drugged i was watching some of the i don't remember all the details of the video but he got drugged, he had his, his cash stolen and his cell phone, wallet, all that kind of stuff. What they ended up were able to do is they did they were able to get it unlocked. I think they were using a face unlock, which if you're gonna use face unlock, there's security settings with that, by the way. Goes out of the scope of this video. But they got in there and because he had a lot of his stuff tied to email, he had the email on his phone, they were able to go in and start changing passwords on his accounts then those verification emails were showing up to the email on that phone. So he lost access to thousands or tens of thousands of dollars worth of crypto, had all of his accounts taken over. So email, there's security issues with it. So just keep that in mind. Now what you can do, this can help. It's not really gonna help you if you have a stolen device and people could just pull up the email on your phone. Let's say they have your password and they take your phone, they can just pull up their email, your email whenever they want. But one way to work around that would be like, obviously to not ever have your email stay logged in on your phone and then you could do something like a hardware key for two-factor authentication in your email. So let's say you use Gmail and you wanna use a YubiKey to log into your email and then you get your two-factor authentication codes to your email. That's something that would work okay. Again, just stuff to consider, keep in mind. 
So now let's cover hardware keys. These are absolutely the best security if you're going to use anything with security, but there are specific considerations with these. Now there's different options that are out there. There's the YubiKey by Yubico. There's the Google Titan key. There's different options. Again, due diligence is really important here. They have their, each has their pros and cons. If you're going to use one of these, it's just really important to do your research to figure out what's going to suit your needs best. That being said, so like I said, these are excellent security. And now one thing that these can do that the other devices cannot. Now this is a pretty specific, this is a pretty specific example right here, but let's say, so they guard against man in the middle attacks. Now in this case, let's say you go to log into Google Mail. So mail.google.com. Now what someone could do, let's say you just end up typing this in wrong or someone somehow is able to fish you with a link or someone is playing the long game, trying to hack in your accounts, you leave your computer open and they go change the bookmark to something malicious and you don't notice, it could be any number of reasons. So instead of you logging into mail.google.com is you log into mail.googie.com. Now when you type this into a web search bar, this is really, ob well, it's somewhat obvious here because of the choice of text. But if you type this into a web browser, for example, the L and an uppercase I, they look exactly alike. And so it would be very easy for someone to hit a website, this is just one of many examples, where someone could go to log into a website, but it's actually fake, and then you go put your two-factor authentication code in there, and then your account gets taken over. Now, with things like the YubiKey or the Titan, is they will be able to detect this. So they, instead of, so let's say instead of mail.google.com, it's this example here is they are not going to input that code. So that's where I'm saying when it can protect against man in the middle attacks, that is an advantage there. A couple of things to keep in mind if you are going to use one of these hardware keys. First of all, there is the, the risk of loss or theft. So, I mean, it, it applies so you could lose your phone with your app or you could lose a key. These, these hardware keys are pretty small. So I could see them getting lost pretty easy or someone could steal them. You have some visitors come over to your house and one of them decides to be a jackass and they steal it because they know what it is and they want to try to do something nefarious with it and they happen to have seen you put in passwords for one of your accounts. There's, there's a number of different ways. Now, like I said, overall security wise, these are really good. Just something to keep in mind. So again, like with the two-factor authentication app, some of these services are going to give you backup codes. So if you lose access to your key, for example, you can put in a backup code. Not all services have this, but when you do get this option, again, just make sure you're storing them somewhere for security. Now, I know this is a case for YubiKey. I don't know if it is for Titan. I don't know a whole lot about Titan. I've never used one. But YubiKey, for example, you can have spare keys. So what you could do in this case is, let's say you order two keys, you could put, you could use one for daily use, that could be what you use to authenticate things. Then you could have a backup stored in either a safe inside of your house, or it could go to a bank and store it inside of a safety deposit box. Presumably the people that are using hardware keys are probably using it for really, really important stuff. So let's say you're using it to secure access into things like a crypto exchange, so like Coinbase or Binance, for example. That's where you're not losing access to your keys and that you have one that you can go pull as a backup if you lose or one gets stolen. The other thing, so this is specific to YubiKey. If they have an update to something or there's some sort of a vulnerability, an issue that comes up with the current version of the key that you have, there's no way to run an update on that. You have to go buy a new key. So again, Doing due diligence and doing research is really, really important with these. And then I'll just show you this here real quick. So there's different examples on here. So you could go and click on to the products on here. They have different ones. So you can get these tiny so you can see how it would be relatively easy to lose one of these little device here. These are pretty small little keys here. And then here's another note. So having multiple options, this does reduce risk of lockout. So let's say, so it's gonna increase security risk though. So a lot of apps out there or a lot of website services will allow you to use multiple options. So you could use a two-factor authentication app, but then fall back to a cell phone or an email. 
it, not, it might not necessarily be a bad idea to have one of those backup options turned on. It, I will say this because there's a lot of people who have lost a lot of crypto because of things like these attacks where people go in and change stuff through email or they do a SIM swap attack or something like that. If it's a financial account, it might not be the greatest idea to have SMS enabled because if you have a lot of money in there and someone knows that and they're dedicated, they could potentially find a way to work around that and get in there. Again, if you go search, if you go search T-Mobile SIM swap attack, you should be able to find this. It, it happened sometime last year. It was it was a pretty big deal. Again, it made national news, so there'd be plenty of articles about it. But if it's for just stuff like, let's say just some random average website or a merchant site or something like that, it might not be that big of a deal to turn on a two-factor authentication app and then have SMS or email as a backup. So that's just something to keep in mind. And then one other thing, so I'm going to give an update here real quick on the website. So this kind of applies to the two-factor authentication stuff we're talking about, but also some general stuff overall. So I just want people to know that the website is not dead. I know I haven't posted on anything here in a little while. I've got a whole bunch of stuff that I'm planning to do. Like as it relates to this video, one thing that I'm going to do at some point here in the future, as soon as my other work kind of calms down a little bit, and I'm not backed up with a bunch of projects, is come in here and have things like all these different app options for two-factor authentication and then the pros and cons of each one. How to turn on backups for this one or security and, and privacy considerations for these apps and all this different stuff. There's a whole bunch of things that I've been wanting to do with this website. Like I said, it's just the future plans that I had for it that it was going to take. I put a ton of work, ton of time into just getting this thing set up, designed, and then writing all of the content that's on here. But I've got a lot of stuff. I'll have like a simple wall tutorial, for example. I know that's something that a few people have asked for is, hey, I don't know what these Windows services are. Do I allow them through this firewall or should I block them through the firewall? So I'll have all of that stuff on here at some point in the future, two-factor authentication. I'm gonna rewrite some of the stuff that's on here, add a whole bunch of stuff just a matter of time. Anyway, it's going to wrap the video up. If you have any questions on anything, even if it's not related to this video, I noticed there's been a, a handful of comments lately of people saying, hey, I don't know where to ask this, and, and I don't know if people feel bad about asking questions when it's not related to the video, but if you have questions on, let's say, a different, top, a different computer's topic or something, if you have those, just make sure you drop them down below. I, it doesn't matter. I'll just answer them whenever they come up, whether or not it applies to the video itself. Anyway. Appreciate support as always, and I will see you next Friday.